The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. Clara and David Harris were approaching their 10th wedding anniversary. She was a dentist, he was an orthodontist, and they'd built a small dental empire together. The couple were a perfect match with shared views about how they wanted to live life. The Harrises had created an existence that most people would envy. After a decade together, however, their relationship dynamic shifted. Clara noticed that her husband had been distancing himself. David was clocking more hours at work, disappearing for long periods of time, and paying more attention to his appearance. He even lost 10 pounds. Clara tried to ignore it and convinced herself that it was just her imagination, but soon she'd find out that it wasn't her imagination. Her marriage was in serious trouble, and the ideal life she'd built with David was going to end in a cataclysm. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case involving David Harris. Clara Harris was born in 1957 as Clara Suarez in Bogota, Colombia. One thing to know about Bogota is that it's a city largely defined by its wide socioeconomic gap. There was little, if any, contact between rich and poor people. Clara's family struggled financially. Making matters worse, when she was six years old, Clara's father died. His death impacted their family significantly and Clara's mom grappled with raising her three daughters alone. Clara mourned her father's absence and was determined to be successful to honor his memory, which is the reason she decided to become a dentist. Dentistry is one of the toughest professional degrees to attain in Colombia, and Clara liked the prestige and money that came with it. She dreamed of having a life of luxury, including a large home, a fancy car, and also a family. She figured that dentistry was a practical way to secure the life she wanted. She'd make good money, and she could even go into private practice, which would give her enough flexibility to raise children one day. After completing dental school in Columbia, Clara made her way to Houston, Texas, to start a dental residency at the University of Texas Houston Dental Branch. Soon after she arrived in Houston, Clara began to build her own American dream. In 1991, in her early 30s, Clara was working at the University of Texas Houston Dental Branch, where she met David Harris. David, also in his 30s, was a charming and brilliant orthodontist who was also completing his dental residency. David had graduated second in his class from the Houston Dental Branch. He had a child from his first marriage, which had recently ended. Clara was smart and drop-dead beautiful, with thick auburn hair, a perfect smile, and a little mole on her left cheek. David, who had a magnetic, folksy nature about him, was absolutely smitten with Clara. Soon after completing her dental residency, Clara was crowned Miss Columbia Houston in a local contest. David's father, Gerald, remembered his son calling him soon after meeting the beauty queen, and David told his father that he knew Clara was the one for him. The pair dated for a short period of time before jumping into marriage. They tied the knot on Valentine's Day 1992, less than a year after their first date. The reception was held at the Nassau Bay Hilton Hotel, across the highway from the looming Johnson Space Center, not far from where David would eventually open his first practice, Space Center Orthodontics. Clara also went into private practice, She decorated her office with pictures of her and her new husband and replaced them with new photos every few months. She and David spoke over the phone two to three times a day, never hanging up before saying, I love you. Soon, the couple meshed their professional lives and began a business partnership together. Since she was a dentist and he was an orthodontist, they started working a few days a week in each other's practices, often sharing the same clients and referring patients to each other. It wasn't long before David and Clara had built a small dentistry empire, owning six dental practices together, 
and bringing home roughly $650,000 a year in household income. It was no secret that the two of them worked very hard. Clara was known to work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and David was no different. They had a shared vision of the future, which was filled with riches, luxuries, vacation homes, and children. David was estranged from his daughter, Lindsay, from a previous marriage, but Clara pushed him to reach out and develop a relationship with his daughter. Soon, David and Lindsay mended their relationship, and Lindsay became a part of her father's new family. Clara treated Lindsay just like her own daughter, but she still wanted children of her own. She and David tried for years to conceive, but fertility issues prevented them from having children. They didn't give up, and after many years of trying, in 1988, Clara gave birth to healthy twin boys. The Harris family lived in a 9,000-square-foot white brick home in Friendswood, a Houston suburb. They owned a ski chalet in Colorado and another vacation home in Texas. They drove expensive cars and took lavish vacations. Their life was picture perfect, complete with all the things they had ever dreamed of. Clara had an eye for design and kept their home well-decorated and spotless. No matter how many patients she had to see, Clara always got home in time to cook dinner for her family. Family was the highest priority in Clara's busy life, and her actions showed it. David Harris seemed to have it made. He had a gorgeous wife, three children, and multiple dental practices. But as the couple's 10th anniversary approached, there was a shift in their relationship dynamic. One thing I hate about buying a new pair of shoes, if there is such a thing, is the process of breaking them in. My new pair of Rothy's, however, felt like I was placing my feet in a bed of pillows. Seriously, there was absolutely no breaking in period or discomfort from day one. Rothy's are not only the most comfortable shoes I've ever worn, they're also the most practical because I can throw them right in the washing machine when they get dirty. Not to mention Rothy's are kind to the planet. They're made from recycled materials. I'm not surprised that People Magazine named Rothy's The Point Best Flat for their first ever style awards in 2021. But Rothy's isn't a one-trick pony. They also make really comfortable loafers, sneakers, ankle boots, and more. I wore my Rothy's The Driver Flats the other day with straight leg Levi's and a cardigan, and I was really feeling myself all day. I ordered my Rothy's in Juniper Green, and they are the cutest statement piece to so many different outfits. If you want a stylish pair of shoes and want to know what it's like to walk around on a cozy massage beads all day, Rothy's shoes should be your next purchase. Solve the case of your next favorite spring shoe with Rothy's, plus get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash murderish. That's $20 off at R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash murderish. It seems like we're all running at a million miles per hour each day and rarely get a moment to ourselves. Lately, the best part of my day has been waiting in the carpool line to pick up my daughter each day. While I'm there, I play Best Fiends because it feels like a nice break from the typical hustle and bustle. I'm currently on level 1786, and I find myself even more determined to get to level 2000. Best Fiends is such a great mobile puzzle game because it doesn't feel like an energy drain. It's actually the opposite of that. After I play, my brain feels like it got a workout and my energy stays up so I can tackle the rest of the day. Best Fiends has so many cute characters that you're going to get totally obsessed with. And once you get hooked on the game, don't worry about it ever ending because new challenging puzzles are added all the time. There are also fun events where you can win rewards. For example, on Wednesdays, if you go through the levels and collect chests that were moved by the crew of the trophy ball of the commander, you can win big rewards. You'll advance through Best Fiends levels like a champ once you start playing because there are thousands of levels and each one of them is exciting and keeps you wanting more. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Who doesn't get a little excited when you hear that cha-ching sound? You know, the one you hear after making a Shopify sale? If you're not yet using Shopify for your business, let me tell you why you should give it a shot. 
Shopify offers an all-in-one solution for anyone to start, run, and grow your online business. You don't have to be a huge business to use Shopify. It's perfect for upstarts, startups, and established businesses looking to sell products locally or across the world. In order to scale your business, you need the right resources and a commerce platform is up there with the most valuable tools necessary to achieve the success you want. Millions of businesses use Shopify to reach customers online and on major social networks, including Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and more. And of course, Shopify offers detailed reports for conversion rates, profit margins, and other key insights that you need to have a grasp on. As your business grows, Shopify will too, right alongside your ever-changing and expanding business. Go to shopify.com slash murderish, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash murderish right now. Shopify.com slash murderish. Clara began noticing that David was less available than usual, but it didn't bother her much. She was busy working and taking care of their children. The couple had agreed to a five-year plan to eliminate all of their debt, and Clara believed that David's absence was because he was putting in more hours at the office to help them reach their financial goals. She would learn in time that this was not the case. Gail Bridges was David's secretary. She was petite with flawless skin and deep brown eyes. She was a former cheerleader, and it showed in her physique. Gail was a recently divorced mother of three, and she caught David's wandering eye. Gail and David had worked together for quite some time before David began viewing her in a different way. He started lingering at the front desk to talk to Gail, and in late February of 2002, David quietly asked her if she'd like to have lunch at a steakhouse in Houston. By April or May, the two of them crossed even more boundaries in their relationship. They began meeting at the Nassau Bay Hilton, where the rooms overlooked the water, and where David and Clara had their wedding reception. At the beginning, the pair kept their affair a secret, making an effort to hide it from others at the office. But after a few months, David and Gail got sloppy. They lingered a bit too long at each other's desks and touched each other during conversations. One coworker recalled an instance when David dropped a file and Gail bent down slowly, arching her backside in David's lingering gaze before picking up the file and handing it back to him with a purposeful stare. It appeared that David and Gail completely stopped trying to hide their affair. They went out often after work, leaving together, and sometimes they held hands without trying to hide it. A coworker recounted a time when a few people from the office were riding in David's car. Gail hopped into the front seat without hesitation and rested her hand on David's chest as he drove. It seemed like everyone, including David's daughter, Lindsay, knew about the affair. The only person who didn't know about it was Clara. Everyone knew and adored Clara, but didn't know how to tell her about what was going on. Eventually, a friend and coworker named Diana sat Clara down and told her the news. David was having an affair with his secretary. Clara was enraged and her world felt like it was crumbling. All of the things that she dreamed of she valued family the most, and now it was slipping right through her fingers. Initially, Clara thought Diana was just trying to ruin her marriage by sharing the bad news that came right out of a cliché handbook, a successful businessman having an affair with his attractive secretary. Though she didn't quite believe Diana, Clara decided to take David out to dinner and ask him about the alleged affair herself. At dinner, David admitted to his affair with Gail, but promised to break it off. He didn't admit to sleeping with her. Instead, he claimed he had only kissed Gail's hand and nothing more. David told Clara that he would do anything to save their marriage, which is exactly what Clara wanted to hear. She told David that he needed to fire Gail immediately. She also insisted they go to marriage counseling. David agreed, but said he wanted to break ties with Gail in person, not over the phone. Clara agreed, thinking this was the most mature course of action. The first person Clara told about the infidelity was her stepdaughter, Lindsay, who admitted that she already knew. 
Lindsay told Clara that everybody at the office knew about David and Gail's affair and that they would go to lunch together all the time. It was apparent to Clara that David had not been honest about his intimate relationship with Gail. Unable to imagine life without her husband, Clara began an all-out campaign to save their marriage. First, she took David to a romantic piano bar where she pressed him about why he was so attracted to Gail, asking, what does she have that I don't? David's answer was brutally honest. He said that he was especially attracted to Gail because she had zero body fat and large breasts. He also admitted to sleeping with her, and then he went a step further, telling his wife that sex with Gail was unbelievable and that she'd have sex with him three times a day. Clara could not comprehend what she was hearing. She was still determined to win her man back. Clara went through a full-blown makeover. She hired a personal trainer, lost 15 pounds, paid a deposit to get breast implants and liposuction, began having sex with David multiple times a day, got a membership to a tanning salon, bought a new, sexier wardrobe, and started getting her hair and nails done multiple times a week. If David wanted zero body fat and large breasts, Clara was going to give him that and more. Then, Clara made one more significant and surprising sacrifice. One morning, she called her dental practice and told them that she was retiring. She was going to take care of her family full time. Despite all her efforts, Clara continued to have reservations about whether their marriage would survive, so she began devising a backup plan. Under Texas law, a divorced couple splits the marital assets evenly, that is, unless one spouse is caught cheating. In Texas, the court may consider infidelity when dividing property and debt between divorcing spouses. The court can award a greater amount of community property to the innocent spouse and or debt to the adulterous spouse. The spouse who was cheated on can receive up to 90% of shared assets. Her rights as an innocent spouse were not lost on Clara. She knew that a divorce may be in her future, and she wanted to be prepared if that happened. If she lost her husband, Clara thought, she wouldn't have the life she had worked so hard for. In order to gather evidence of David's infidelity, Clara hired a private investigator to follow him and track his activities. She instructed the private investigator to follow David and Gail the day that her husband said he was going to break things off with his mistress. David and Gail were supposed to meet at a local restaurant, but the investigator notified Clara that the pair were not at the restaurant. They had checked in at the Nassau Bay Hilton, which had a significance in David and Clara's relationship. After hanging up with the private investigator, Clara lost it. She and Lindsay jumped into Clara's car, an S-Class Mercedes, and drove over to the Nassau Bay Hilton. The two of them ran inside the hotel and began searching for David and Gail. They scanned the hotel restaurant, the lobby, and even the bathrooms. Frantically, Clara ordered Lindsay to call her dad's cell phone and make up a story about one of the twins being gravely ill and tell David that he needed to get home immediately. Soon after the phone call, David and Gail emerged from the elevator, holding hands. Clara spotted them from across the lobby and observed David looking at Gail the same way he looked at her all those years ago. Infuriated, Clara threw herself at Gail, screaming and wailing and thrashing her hands in the air. Lindsay lunged at her dad, yelling at him in utter disgust. How could you do this? A hotel security guard noticed the commotion and intervened. The guard separated Clara and Gail, but Clara was not ready to give up just yet. The security guard escorted Clara and Lindsay back to their car. Clara surveyed the cars in the parking lot and realized that David and Gail must have arrived in the same car. At that point, she became hysterical. All Clara could think about was stopping them. She couldn't let her husband and Gail leave together. Clara became overcome with rage gripping her steering wheel tightly. Then, she spotted David and Gail walking toward Gail's Lincoln Navigator. Clara took off, gassing the Mercedes toward Gail's SUV. At the last moment, she jerked the steering wheel to the side, flying into the right side of Gail's SUV, hopping the curb, 
and striking David, who was about to get into Gail's vehicle. Upon impact, David's body became airborne and landed on the hood of Clara's Mercedes. Clara continued to drive, bouncing over two curbed, grassy medians that separated the rows of parking spaces. David's body landed on the paved parking lot about 65 feet from where he'd first been hit. Clara then drove over her husband's body. When she realized what happened, Clara leaped from her car yelling, David, 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 and then she hovered over his body. David died right there in the parking lot. The Nassau Bay police were quick to arrive at the scene. They quickly summoned emergency medical services and transported Clara to the police station for questioning. It was unclear to all involved whether Clara meant to kill David. The private investigator that Clara hired caught the whole ordeal on video, but the footage was distant and grainy, making it hard to follow. What the video did show was that the first circle Clara made with her car was wide and it was followed by a noticeably sharper circle. Clara then made one more half circle and stopped the car next to David's body. Clara was charged in connection with David's death, and she would eventually go on trial. A pretrial hearing for the case of the State of Texas versus Clara Harris happened on January 29, 2003. As reported by Leanne Hart's 2003 LA Times article, during the hearing, Lindsay Harris, Clara's stepdaughter, who was 17 at the time, testified against Clara. Though the two of them once enjoyed a close relationship, that all changed after David's death. Lindsay's testimony was filled with tears and anger. She described her relationship with Clara as being very close and motherly, saying on the stand, We went shopping a lot. She would tell me pretty much everything that was going on and made me feel part of the family. Lindsay went on to explain the complicated feelings she felt toward her father, testifying, I never thought he'd do something like that to her. He went to church and loved Clara. She recounted that her father told her that he felt neglected by Clara after the twins were born. She then recalled in detail the events leading up to her father's death. Lindsay described how Clara got behind the wheel with an emotionless face, emphasizing that her stepmother wasn't crying. Lindsay described how during the incident, she repeatedly screamed at Clara to stop as the car rushed toward her father, but Clara wouldn't listen. Lindsay testified that Clara ran over her father three times. She spoke about the night of her father's murder, saying that as soon as she returned home, she took all of his clothes out of the trash where Clara had ordered them thrown and spread them out on her bed so she could feel closer to him. Clara Harris's trial began in February of 2003 at the 177th District Court in Harris County. She was represented by George Parnum, a well-respected attorney with a tendency to forget names and wander off the point. In addition to Lindsay Harris, six eyewitnesses testified that Clara had run over David's body multiple times while circling in the back parking lot, though their testimony differed in certain details. Among the witnesses was Evangelos Smiros, the hotel manager, who testified that Clara ran over David's body three times. Paul Garrett Clark, the front desk manager, testified that Clara ran over David three times and then backed up over his body for a fourth time. The night manager, Jose Miranda, testified that Clara ran over the body two times. Ashok Moza, who was playing tennis on the courts at the time of the incident, testified that the Mercedes twice ran over what he initially believed to be a duffel bag, but that upon approaching the scene, it turned out to be a person. Chris Junko, who was also on the tennis courts, testified that he saw Clara drive over David three times. Oscar Torres, also playing tennis at the time, told the jury that he saw the Mercedes round the corner of the Lincoln Navigator, and when it reappeared, the Mercedes and David's body were flowing together, and Clara then ran over David's body three times. The defense's expert witness, accident reconstructionist Steve Irwin, testified during a pretrial hearing and at trial that Clara could have only run over David once after initially hitting him as he was standing by Gail's SUV. He further testified at trial that Clara, as she came around the navigator, would not have had enough time to stop before striking David. To support this claim, 
Attorney Parnum offered into evidence two videotapes made by the accident reconstruction expert. In the videos, Irwin recreated the route driven by Clara after she left the parking space in the front parking lot of the Nassau Bay Hilton. Irwin's video recreated a vehicle going around the black navigator, striking David, and then continuing on for the two and a half 360 degree turns in the empty area of the parking lot before coming to a complete stop. The video footage was shot from the middle of the back seat of a rented Mercedes S430. Irwin conceded that the driver would have had a better view of events than the videotape showed. He also conceded that the speed of the car in the videotape did not match that of Clara's Mercedes on the night in question because he didn't want to damage the undercarriage of the rented Mercedes. Irwin also created a virtual reality depiction of Clara's route in the parking lot using computer animation, simulation, and the video footage captured by the private investigator. He used measurements taken by the police as well as his own measurements to further support his theory that given the final resting place of David's body and the location of a blood stain beside the body, Clara only ran over David one time and by accident. This videotape omitted any model or dummy to represent David. Instead, Irwin placed an X to mark the blood stain that was found near the body. Irwin testified that the Mercedes never drove through the blood stain. In an unusual move, Clara Harris took the stand in her own defense on February 6, 2003, against the wishes of her attorney. Several of Clara's relatives from Columbia were in the Harris County courtroom to support her. According to a 2003 New York Times article by Nick Madigan, Clara gave an emotional account of the love and loss of her marriage. She said on the stand, We were best friends. We were very much in love. She explained that they had a successful professional partnership, too, and were raising two children together. When it came time to speak about her husband's affair with 39-year-old Gail Bridges, Clara became sarcastic, adopting a high-pitched tone to imitate Gail's voice. She then went on to quote from a side-by-side -side comparison her husband had made of the two women, calling Clara pretty, smart, and educated, and referring to Gail Bridges as just reasonably pretty, smart, and educated. Clara went on to recount how her husband told her that Gail communicated with him better than she did and allowed him to do anything he wanted sexually. Clara insisted that she never intended to kill David. She said that she was simply trying to destroy Gail's navigator and that she didn't know that David was standing next to it at the time. She testified that it all happened so fast and in such a blur. She claimed she practically had a blackout during the whole incident and insisted it was an accident. I've found a way to sneak in a little me time at the end of my day, and surprisingly, it's during my skincare routine at the end of the day. While I'm washing my face and applying my favorite overnight sensation brightening sleep mask by Thrive Cosmetics, I hit play on whatever podcast I'm binging at the time. I look so forward to this brief moment every day, in the morning, I do it all over again. I press play on a podcast, then rinse off my face, and it always feels so hydrated and smooth after wearing the sleep mask all night. My morning routine includes Thrive Cosmetics Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara because I can't imagine facing the day without it. This mascara makes my lashes look crazy long, and it lasts all day without smudging or flaking. With Thrive Cosmetics, I get effective skin-loving products and I feel great knowing that some of the money I spent is donated to women emerging from homelessness, surviving domestic abuse, fighting cancer, and more. Thrive Cosmetics does this charitable giving through their Bigger Than Beauty mission. Now is a great time to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com murderish. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash murderish for 15% off your first order. I recently signed up for an investigative journalism course on Masterclass, taught by Pulitzer Prize winner Bob Woodward, who helped expose President Nixon's corruption. Now, I'm no journalist, but with Masterclass, I can take courses to help me in so many different areas. Whatever you're into or want to learn more about, 
Masterclass probably has an online class for you that's taught by an expert in that field. And you can learn at your own pace, pause and resume the class as needed. By taking the investigative journalism class, I'm hoping to hone my skills as a true crime podcaster and specifically for a new podcast I'm currently developing. I'm going on a road trip in a few weeks, and what's great is that I'll be able to listen to my masterclass while I'm driving. If you're into fitness, for example, master trainer Joe Holder teaches a masterclass on the subject of wellness and fitness. Masterclass makes it so easy to take their courses. You can take them on your phone, your computer, or your smart TV. And annual memberships start at just $180 per year. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass, and as a murderish listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash murderish now. That's masterclass.com slash murderish for 15% off masterclass. Over 97% of women aged 19 to 50 aren't getting sufficient vitamin D from their diet, and 95% aren't getting enough of key omega-3s. Rituals Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin is a simple way to fill nutrient gaps for women in this category. Rituals Multivitamin is not only formulated to support brain, bone, and blood health, it's also been through a university-led clinical trial to ensure effectiveness for women 18 plus. The clinical study, which was published in leading scientific journal, Frontiers in Nutrition, resulted in a 43% increase in vitamin D levels and a 41% increase in omega-3 DHA levels in 12 weeks for women 18 plus. In the morning, when I take my Ritual multivitamin, I feel good knowing that no shady stuff is going into my body because Ritual is third-party tested by USP and the non-GMO project and contains traceable and vegan-friendly ingredients. Right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash murderish and turn healthy habits into a ritual. That's 10% off at ritual.com slash murderish. During the trial, Clara's staunchest supporters may have come as a surprise to a lot of people. David's parents, Mildred and Gerald Harris, adored Clara and showed their support for her throughout the trial. A dignified, church-going couple dressed in tweeds and practical footwear, Mildred and Gerald sat a few feet behind their daughter-in-law in the gallery, alongside several close friends and members of Clara's family from Columbia. Mildred and Gerald testified for the defense, and according to Nick Madigan of the New York Times, Mildred's testimony was loving and filled with warmth toward her daughter-in-law. She proclaimed on the witness stand, I love her very much, as she smiled warmly toward Clara. Mildred went on to explain her close relationship with Clara, saying, she's really more like a daughter. David's parents said that they had forgiven their daughter-in-law. The couple went on to describe Clara and David's marriage as a picture-perfect relationship that was, in Mildred's words, made in heaven. Mildred told the jury that David loved Clara as much as someone could possibly love another person. The New York Times quoted Mildred as saying, In 10 years, David never had a negative thing to say about Clara. Sometimes I think Clara loved him too much. David's father, Gerald, a former school principal and later directed the transportation division of a school district before he retired, said his son was a good husband and a good father to their young twin boys. He conceded on the witness stand, that David's extramarital affair with Gail Bridges was not proper. In their testimony, Gerald and Mildred both agreed with a suggestion by the defense attorney, George Parnum, that Clara had always been a truthful and law-abiding person. In her rebuttal, Assistant District Attorney Mia Magnus cited witnesses' testimony that Clara had lied about one of her twins being sick to persuade David to return home on the day he died and that she had vandalized Gail's Lincoln Navigator, and that she had assaulted Gail in the hotel lobby shortly before her husband was killed. In his closing argument, George Parnum contended that Clara was distraught after a week-long series of humiliations, beginning with her husband's admission of the affair, but that she meant no harm to him and continued to love him. Parnum said David Harris had subjected his wife to a detailed comparison between her and his lover. He said that Clara, in an effort to regain her husband's love and fidelity, 
tried to prove herself worthy of David's love. She did this by hiring a fitness trainer, making an appointment for breast enhancement surgery, dyeing her auburn hair blonde, going several times to a tanning salon, and buying a new flashy wardrobe. Parnum portrayed Gail Bridges as the villain in the case, labeling her a homewrecker who enticed and seduced David into a relationship that should have never happened. Parnum said that Clara had hired a private investigator to track her husband and his lover in order to prove that Gail Bridges was after David's money. He painted David as a man who made some bad choices and unfortunately fell victim to love and passion. Parnum told the jury that Clara was the last in the office to know about the affair, so of course she fired Gail Bridges. He asked, what wife would do otherwise? A question the New York Times said Parnum repeated several times in his closing. According to Parnum, Clara did not completely trust David, but who would after finding out about their husband's affair? He told the jury that Clara was concerned about her husband's pattern of deception, and she feared she was being strung along and lied to. She tried to track him down on July 24th to make sure he was breaking up with Miss Bridges as he'd promised. Parnum pointed out that with Clara in the car was her 16-year-old stepdaughter, Lindsay. According to the New York Times, he then asked the jury, do you think for one moment that had Clara Harris intended to kill her husband, she would have had her stepdaughter in the car? Assistant District Attorney Mia Magnus recalled one witness who testified that after Clara ran over David, she stopped the car and rushed to her husband's dead body. The witness claimed that Clara then cried out, David, do you see what you made me do? With that quote, Magnus tried to show the jury that Clara was conscious of her actions and not in some irrational fog of passion, as the defense had contended. The prosecutor reminded jurors that in the pretrial hearing, Lindsay Harris had quoted her stepmother as saying, I'm going to hit him as the car raced toward David. Magnus faced the jury and claimed that the theory of David's death being an accident had been dismantled and picked apart. She acknowledged that David's affair caused his wife pain and the jury probably sympathized with Clara, but she said, she is the only one responsible for David's death. As quoted by Nick Madigan of the New York Times, Magnus said, no one has suggested that she went to that hotel with the intention of killing. She acted on her anger and frustration and a man is dead because of it. Magnus then pointed in Clara's direction and said, that despite her efforts, David was still in love with Gail. She said that all of Clara's efforts to separate her husband from Gail seemed to not be working. She told the jury that in the heat of the moment, Clara had used what she had to stop David and Gail from having each other, and what Clara had was her car. Magnus emphasized that Clara clearly meant to kill David in that parking lot. She reasoned that when someone repeatedly runs over a person with their car, their intent is not to hurt them. Their intent is clearly to murder them. As reported by Nick Madigan in the New York Times, Magnus said, This is murder. She then turned to the jury and said, It is time for you to call her what she is, and that is a murderer. On February 13, 2003, the jury found Clara Harris guilty of murder but that she acted in sudden passion. As Judge Carol G. Davies read the decision, Clara crumpled into a chair and buried her head in her hands. Under Texas law, the jury would also be deciding a sentence. After deliberating for six hours, they sentenced Clara to 20 years in prison, the maximum allowed, plus a fine of $10,000. The finding of sudden passion meant that Clara would receive a reduced sentence and that she would only have to serve half of the 20-year term before being eligible for parole. If it weren't for that finding, Clara's conviction could have sent her to prison for up to 99 years. Clara was incarcerated at a state prison in Gatesville, Texas. In 2007, she was brought back to Houston for a civil trial. David's parents, who'd previously been supportive of Clara, filed a wrongful death lawsuit. This time around, the jury had little sympathy for Clara's story. They ordered her to pay her former in-laws 
$3.75 million in damages. During her time in prison, Clara was a model prisoner. As part of a prison program, she learned Braille and worked several hours a day translating school textbooks into Braille. On top of her charity work, Clara followed every prison rule to a T. Emily DeToto, one of Clara's original defense attorneys, said that Clara's only goal was to get paroled so she could reunite with her sons. While Clara was incarcerated, her twin sons lived with her closest friends, Anna and Pat, who also had twin sons of their own. While she served her sentence, Clara was allowed to see her boys for two hours every month. It was those visits that kept Clara going. She said the twins gave her hope that a better life for her was still possible outside of the Gatesville prison. Clara first became eligible for parole in 2012, but she was turned down. Over the next five years, she applied and was rejected three more times. Some members of David's family told the parole board that they would never forgive her. They repeatedly wrote letters to the parole board arguing that Clara did not deserve parole and that she was a murderer and deserved to serve her full 20-year sentence, which was up in 2023. But in 2017, Clara got a new parole attorney, Kevin Stewie of San Antonio, and he came up with a new strategy. At Clara's parole hearing in October of 2017, Stewie brought her two sons, who were now 19 years old and attending universities in Texas. The young men told the parole board they had come to prison every month for the last 15 years without fail to visit their mother. Yes, the twins acknowledged, they had lost their father, but at the same time, they had lost their mother, whom they loved deeply. They told the parole board that they were victims twice over. At 8.30 on the morning of May 11, 2018, after serving 15 years, Clara Harris walked out of prison a free woman, but subject to certain conditions. She was ordered to have no contact with her former in-laws, her stepdaughter, or David's former mistress. She was also required to live in Galveston County and to wear an ankle monitor. Clara left prison at 60 years old, still owing David's parents $3.75 million and unable to practice as a dentist because of her conviction. The company that managed the prison braille program asked Clara to keep working for them because of her high quality of work. Although she has many detractors, one of Clara's original defense attorneys, Emily DeToto, believes that the community should accept her back. DeToto said, yes, she made a horrible 15-minute mistake, but she's a wonderful woman. It's time to forgive her and let her move on. Clara's parole ends in 2023. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Murderish. If you want access to ad-free bonus episodes of Murderish, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Visit Murderish.com, click the link to go behind the scenes to support the podcast through Patreon. All patrons get access to ad-free bonus episodes of Murderish and some other really cool perks. Jesse K. and Lars are the most recent people to become Murderish Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your support. If you're planning to attend CrimeCon in Las Vegas this year, use my code MURDERISH for 10% off a standard badge. That's code MURDERISH for 10% off. If you're on the fence about attending, I can tell you from experience that CrimeCon is such a fun and worthwhile event. Head over to CrimeCon.com and use code MURDERISH for 10% off. If you enjoy this podcast, do me the biggest favor and rate and review MURDERISH in your favorite podcast app. Positive ratings and reviews help new listeners find the show, and I also really love hearing from you guys. Also, follow me on Instagram at Murderish Podcast. It's my favorite place to engage with you guys. You can also find me on Twitter and on Facebook. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish t-shirts, face masks, coffee mugs, and more. Murderish sound design and audio editing is by Justin Hellstrom. Some of the music was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Catherine Devine. Stick around after the closing music and ads to hear a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish.
Sources for this episode include court documents from the 177th District Court of Harris County for case number 918-964-A. Three 2003 New York Times articles by Nick Madigan, a 2003 LA Times article by Leanne Hart, a 2004 Justia U.S. Law Opinion, and a 2006 ABC article.